This is Greg Trowing with Maritime Reporter TV, and we're very pleased to be joined today by Dr. Anil Sharma, CEO and founder of GMS, to discuss trends in the ship scrapping business. So, Dr. Sharma, I'm sure that many of our viewers know the GMS name, but to start, can you give a brief overview, a by the numbers look at GMS today? By the numbers. So GMS, uh, Craig, was formed in the uh, U.S. almost uh, 25 years ago. Yeah. And it started by buying ships from uh, U.S. Marad. And once we are done with them, with the Russian Navy for about five years, we were just buying uh, uh, naval vessels, support vessels from both U.S. Marad and, and the Russian Navy. And, uh, and I was also teaching as a, as a professor. So this was a part-time job. And I realized, okay, we, this, there's a value in what we are doing here and we went commercial. So, and uh, for the last 10, 15 years, we have been doing the biggest volumes globally. Uh, when I say volume, just uh, in terms of, I think we do about one third of the global fleet annually. Um, you know, we measure it by number of ships or light rate, which is the weight. Uh, it's probably more if you go with very lightweight, which may be as high as 40% because we tend to do big ships, big projects, uh, rather than smaller units. Of course, we do that as well. In terms of annual uh, uh, number of deals we do, the highest we have done is about 300 plus ships in one year. So that's pretty much one ship a day. Uh, in terms of the lowest, it may be around, around 150 ships. Uh, so it, 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 it moves between uh, 150, generally to 250, depending on how bad the world economy is, which sector is being punished. Uh, if the sectors are doing well, which they are doing right now, for example, containers and dry bulk are both doing fantastic. You're not gonna see much volumes uh, this year unless something goes catastrophically wrong. Uh, so it, it gravitates uh, in terms of uh, the number of ships and the type of vessels. The interesting thing is everything has a life cycle. There are life cycle changes. For example, uh, the cruise ships tend to have the longest life cycles, except when COVID came in and suddenly COVID, a lot of cruise ships were recycled. Um, otherwise, uh, I think the shortest life cycle I'm seeing right now is, of course, in the offshore space. We are seeing uh, 10 years, even younger units being recycled, which is insane. Yeah, I haven't seen that. So Dr. Sharma, as you well know, COVID-19 uh, has impacted uh, all industries for the past 12 months, and uh, we don't know when that will end. Um, how has it impacted the ship scrapping business, both logistically for your own company, uh, but also as far as ship scrapping prices go? Wow. I mean... This is a black swan event, right? I mean, uh, this is un totally unprecedented. So, so the first Q1, I mean, you're talking about almost like March Q1 when this thing started and flared up, you know? And uh, uh, so that from March, April, were probably one of the most difficult months. We didn't know where's the bottom. In fact, probably the only time, we, we put out a weekly every, every end of every week. Uh, which talks about where the prices are, what's happening in this, in this market. And for the first time for about several weeks, we said we can't talk prices. We stopped quoting prices. The Baltic was still doing its prices. And I was telling the Baltic guys, how are you coming with these numbers? Because if the owner comes and tells me I have a ship to sell, you know, we buy ships, Greg, on per ton basis, lightweight. I said, I don't know how to quote because there's no demand. There's no buyer. You know, everything is at standstill. The world is in lockdown mode, meaning the recycling yards are in lockdown mode. So we had those issues in terms of just the numbers, not knowing where the market is. And, and it was pretty catastrophic from, from that angle. The yards were shut down, uh, countries in lockdown. The other challenge we had is we buy, I think at least half of our ships are bought what is called as is where it is. So we are constantly having crew fly all over the world. And that became a nightmare because of COVIDs and, and, and flights got canceled. We were chartering planes, so the costs were going up. And even when the crew lands, you have 14 days quarantine in hotels. And then suddenly one person gets 
you know, uh, tested positive and it becomes nightmare. Nobody can go on board. So I think logistically, it was one of the most difficult years or it still has been with the crew. Uh, that, that part has not really gone away. But in terms of the commercial aspects, uh, it just took off. I, I don't know, I can recollect in about 25 years I've been doing this, where you had a straight, you know, you call about V-shaped recoveries and you think, oh, come on, I mean, no, <laughs> it's hard to find this. It just took off. So we gained in prices about 70% increase in, in residual values and scrap values in a matter of about eight to nine months. I mean. To me, that's huge, a 70% increase is unprecedented. So number-wise, I mean, still somebody was asking me today, he said, when is this going to stop? Because it seems like every day it's a new benchmark. Prices keep on going higher. What we are getting better at, but still a challenge is the logistics part. How to keep our crew safe, how to get them, which ports, what destinations, I mean, and, and it's, it's emerging. I mean, we, we bought some ships in Brazil last week and we were just, I was talking to the managers and they were saying, oh, Brazil is okay. We, crew can go with, okay, to board with Siemens passport. And I said, you know, but that's today's news. Brazil, the cases are going up. We are taking delivery of this ship mid-April. Mid-April could be a different game. So let's plan, plan B, plan C. So we have to do a lot of these redundancies. So Dr. Sharma, thank you for that insight. Um, when you look at ship scrapping activity today, where do you see the most activity? I know you covered it briefly previously, um, but as we've been discussing now for, I believe, six years, uh, the offshore oil and gas market has been down. Um, and have you seen any uptick in the offshore asset recycling specifically in that, in that sector? Yeah, I think offshore has been, um, again, unprecedented, you know, the, until this, um, this, this fall in these, uh, in the offshore sector, the, the, the oil prices, it, it, offshore units used to be like few a year. You can literally count them on, on sometimes one hand or maybe you know, less than 10. Uh, and then there's just the floodgates open. The, the numbers are large. The challenge though is that because unlike, uh, I, I'm not sure if you know this, Greg, when in ship recycling, normally when the owner is building a vessel, the general rule of thumb was that you can estimate 20% as RV, residual value. So meaning now an owner is really calculating how much money they can make within the lifetime before they are to recycle and when they recycle. So 20% is not bad. You know, if you, after 20 years of trading a unit or 25 years, you can still get 20%. That's 80% is a 20, 25 years, a long time to amortize 80%. That doesn't happen in offshore. The gap between the new build price and the residual value is enormous. So for a jackup owner, for example, he was like, you know what? I might as well leave this thing here because I just got nothing for it. And if the market changes, it turns around. So for a while, most of these offshore guys were not scrapping. They were like, if I scrap and the other guy doesn't, what happens? And, and if the market turns around, you know, I can suddenly start printing money again versus if I scrap now, I got really nothing. So the drill chips, the floaters, I mean, some of those guys who had high daily costs, sure. They had no choice, but there was almost one nine months a sand standstill that people didn't want to, to recycle the scrap because they were afraid if the neighbors don't, <laughs> I'm probably digressing. So my point is offshore is, is, is a huge in it. This is where modern ships are being recycled. And when they recycle this, this cell in fleets, very rarely is one unit. FPSOs, FS, well, FSUs are not, but FPSOs, uh, jackups, semi subs, drills, drill ships, big sector. Other sector that is emerging this year is going to be tankers, you know, because for a long time, uh, the crude business has not recycled. And now with the value, you know, charter rates coming down, we do expect uh, a lot of these were in, sto in storage, for example, with the contango pretty much disappearing, you know, that is the reason. So I think these are two things we, we, we foresee some uh, supply emerging. 
uh, but not as from dry bulk or from from box ships. I think those those two sectors are doing you know, quite well in, in that area. I'll assume that your business is very difficult to project 12, 24, 36 months out. But when you look ahead to 2021, 2022, mm -hmm. can you give some insight on where you see recycling business coming from? Oh, let's let's look from as much 360 as we can. I mean, first is um, I think recycling, there's an increasing awareness of recycling. Recycling has, has always had an image problem. You know, people who understand that, that the pictures you have seen normally are negative, not positive. And so whenever it's recycling, you think about recycling, you think about guys who are, you know, and not taking care of you know, poor working conditions or, or, or pollution and so forth. That's not the case. So the spotlight has been in the recycling industry almost for a decade since the Hong Kong Convention you know, was ratified. So from the regulation perspective, recycling is still keeps on finding its space. I think most of us have accepted Hong Kong Convention as, as the main way for sustainable recycling. You can call it green recycling. You can call it environmentally responsible recycling. I like to call it sustainable recycling. And of course, Europe decided to come up with its own set of criteria, and I think uh, it, it has not been very successful because it was not well thought through. There was a lot of political pressure to do that. Doesn't make sense. So from the regulatory perspective, I think uh, things are getting in place uh, in terms of what convention to follow, what's, what defines response or sustainable recycling or green recycling. So that, that's a good part, but that's gonna get increasingly with ESG and all these things happening, that's a change for the good. People are accepting that there are good yards and bad yards everywhere. It's not country specific, it's yard specific. In terms of uh, prices, this is where the, the question I get asked, I get asked the most by you know, capital providers as well as from ship owners. You know, where do I see? Because you don't really have a hedging tool, you know, unlike any other industry where you can hedge your forward risk. We are pretty much the, the hedge providers, if you consider that. And we are not listed or rated companies that, are, that are somebody like Merce would come in and saying, hey, let me call up my broker or advisor and hedge, you know, forward risk. We do that. And we somehow come up with are we what we believe is a relatively safe, and then we create benchmarks with BDA, the Baltic Demolition Assessment, where we tell the owners we can't call the future either. You know what? We can give you some hedging tool where you can take away 20%, 80%, 70%, depending on what your risk appetite is, at a forward rate that we can guarantee. And then we we can compare today's rate with the BDA at that time and decide. Some owners like to see a floor, some capital providers like to, especially private equity guys, they like to see a floor that below which so it's a guaranteed. I have seen numbers that are being talked about last week, a bank was saying that the RV, they're looking two years forward, only $50 per ton. And keep in mind today is almost 500. So people are like, I was like, really? I mean, I don't see it that low. I normally tell my team a price around $300 per ton is a relatively good price, you know, to, to hedge forward risk set. And we go case by case. So pricing wise, we always believe that, okay, because it's, you know, you, the, the cycles are very fast. You know, you don't have those nice gentle cycles because we're in the commodity business. Like we're talking 70% increase in 70, I mean, so drops are the same thing. So we don't do uh, that, that's hard to head so forward. But supply-wise, I, I think that the big rush we had 2012, which was the biggest year in the history of sh you know, ship recycling, you don't have that kind of hangover, you know, because that 2012 came on the back of 2000, pre-2008. So we don't, bangs, everybody has wisened up. So the fleet net growth is quite sensible. So you will not have this big surge. I mean, you'll have, 10, 15 cruise ships, but okay, that you can, you know, in a very short period of time. So you have this kind of kangaroo hops, you know, where suddenly 
ships come in and then there's nothing there's like another jump comes and stops so <laughs> it makes us more, more it makes our life more interesting Thank you.